Today we will tell you the stories of maniacs and murderers who were caught, punished, but were released from prison early. Yes, in movies and books we are used to that justice always triumphs, but in real life it is not always so. Vicious recidivists, pedophiles and cannibals got out of prison because of the imperfections of the judicial system. And to keep it short, let's start with perhaps the most ridiculous reason for early release from supervision. Alexander Clark was 40 years old when his wife Nixian found out about his infidelity. Alexander decided not to go far and slept with the nanny of their two-year-old child. The nanny was 17 by then. Not intending to tolerate such humiliation, Nixian threatened Alexander to leave him and file for divorce. He flew into a rage and attacked his wife. He beat her for a long time and then strangled her right in front of his own child. To finish the case without any problems, he put his wife's body in a suitcase and buried it on top of a hill. But it didn't help. After only five days, Nixon's body was found. The court sentenced Alexander to 67 years in prison. And here's where watch your hands because after only eight years, he was released. How did that happen? We'll tell you. The court lost the computer on which the transcripts of court sessions were stored. The lawyer, on the basis of this fact, achieved the release of his ward. They say, on the one hand, because of the loss of data, Alexander cannot file a petition for parole or appeal, and on the other, it also deprives the court of the right to consider the case. That's it. It's as simple as that. Of course, the relatives of the murdered were shocked, but there was nothing they could do. The next story will be about a man standing up to law enforcement about a man who decided that disregarding the rules could and should be done. Louis Van Schuur was an ordinary policeman in South Africa whose job was to monitor alarms. Of course, he's been out in the field too. So far, so good, right? One thing. For some reason, Van Schuur's shift statistics showed an increase in robbers killed in custody. Van Schuur himself attributed this to the fact that he was just doing his job. When Louis finally got the interest of law enforcement and was questioned, he confessed to the murders and claimed to have killed over 100 people. It turned out that his victims were either black or mixed race. Neither age nor gender mattered. None of them were armed, which gives experts reason to speak of racial hatred as a motive for the crimes. The media in turn dubbed him a racist murderer. Van Shaw strenuously denied such accusations. As a result, he was tried for 19 murders, but found guilty of only seven and two attempted murders. In 1992, Louis was sentenced to 20 years in prison, but served only 12. Why? Because he repented and embarked on a path of faith and reformation. Yeah, yeah, you don't think so. He was literally released from prison on his own recognizance. After his release, Van Schoor met his fiancée. Well, if the following story doesn't outrage you, we don't even know. Why be sly, though? We've got more than one maniac released before his time. But for now, meet Issei Sagawa. Born in post-war Japan, Issei Sagawa went to school in the early 80s. Not just anywhere, but in Paris, at the Sorbonne Academy. He studied avant-garde literature. On June 11, 1981, Sagawa, who by then was already 32 years old, invited his classmate at the Sorbonne, Dutch woman Reni Hartevelt, for dinner in his apartment under the pretext of translating poems for homework. Sagawa planned to kill and eat her to absorb her energy. Being 1 meter 44 centimeter tall, Sagawa considered himself weak, ugly, and small. For the characteristics he felt he lacked, he chose tall, statuesque Rene, who was 1 meter 78 centimeter tall. When Rene began reciting poetry, Sagawa crept up behind her and shot her in the neck with a rifle. According to Sagawa, he passed out from shock, but woke up determined to carry out his plan. To begin, Sagawa raped Rene's corpse, but was never able to bite through her skin, so he had to leave the apartment and buy a butcher knife. After dismembering Rene, Sagawa ate most of her breasts, face, buttocks, feet, thighs, and neck in raw or cooked form, and stored other body parts in the refrigerator. And key, Sagawa took photos of every step of his monstrous meal, which eventually became hard evidence of his crime. Four days later, the remains of Rene's body began to decompose, and Sagawa attempted to dump two suitcases filled with his victim's remains into the lake. He was caught by French police in the Bois de Boulogne Park near the lake. As you probably realized by now, this is where the fun begins. 
It so happened that Sagawa was not from a simple family, and his father first of all hired him a very expensive lawyer. Probably thanks to this, after two years of detention, the judge declared Sagawa insane at the time of the crime and sent him to a psychiatric hospital, from where Sagawa gave various interviews, including one Japanese writer, who shortly after that published a detailed story on behalf of the killer in one of the Japanese magazines. Whether it was the publicity and growing fame of his father's lawyer that did the trick, the French authorities eventually decided to deport him to Japan, where Sagawa was immediately admitted to Matsuzawa Hospital in Tokyo. And here is where it gets interesting. Japanese psychiatrists declared him sane and concluded that sexual perversion was Sagawa's sole motivation for the murder. In France, the charges against Sagawa were dropped and the French court documents were sealed. There was no talk of even handing over the evidence and all sorts of proof to Japanese law enforcement. As a consequence, under Japanese law, Sagawa simply could not be detained. On August 12, 1986, Sagawa was released from the hospital and subsequently remained at large until his death on November 24, 2022. He lived to the age of 73. And the following story took place in a country renowned for its security. In the summer and autumn of 1981, a series of suspicious deaths were discovered at a nursing home in a quiet spot in Norway. And of course, the police became interested in the manager, Anfin Nesset. When questioned by the police, Nasset initially confessed to the murders of 27 patients, whom he claimed he killed by injecting them with saxomethonium chloride, a drug that paralyzes muscles. He was charged with 25 counts of murder, but later recanted his confession and denied all charges until the end of the five months trial. The chief prosecutor at the trial, Olaf Jehelm, described Nasset as an ambitious man who wanted complete control over the life and death of his victims. And although he was eventually convicted of 22 poisonings, some experts speculate that the number of victims could have been as high as 138 cases. But only 22 murders were proven, for which Nasset was sentenced to 21 years in prison. In no way this is the maximum sentence. But even that sentence Nasset didn't serve. He was released after 12 years for good behavior. For the next 10 years, Nasset was under surveillance by the Norwegian police. Now he lives somewhere in Norway under a new name. Our next recidivist murderer became the first Russian criminal to be released from a life sentence, Anvar Masalima from Ufa. Although he had a life sentence, but with the right to parole after 25 years, which he took advantage of. It all started with the fact that in the late 70s, Masalima got drunk quarreled with a colleague and stabbed him to death. He went to prison for 15 years. In 1991, the killer was released, but a few months later, he returned to the zone. On August 17, 1991, Mosolimov strangled a pensioner from whom he rented a room. The reason was the same, a drunken quarrel. Mosolimov dismembered the man's corpse and tried to burn it in the stove, and when he failed, he buried it on his own property. In his defense, Anvar said that the pensioner had burned his clothes, documents and personal belongings. After a tip-off from neighbors, Anvar was arrested and sentenced to capital punishment, firing squad. But in 1998, a moratorium on the death penalty was introduced, and the sentence was reduced to life imprisonment. And that's where additional conditions come into play. On June 22, 2016, after serving 25 years in penal colonies, where the most brutal killers, terrorists and pedophiles sit, Anwar was released on parole. After his release, he returned to his native Ufa. But you don't think Masalimov actually reformed, do you? First, in April 2018, he was almost accused of murdering a drinking buddy, who was actually stabbed to death by his cohabitant Elena. And then, on November 17th of the same year, during a drunken argument, Masalimov stuck a knife into the liver of a friend. The man was saved, and Anwar was jailed for five years in 2019 for causing serious harm to health. Nikita Bergenstrom, also known as Juha Valjakala, has a similar story. After Juha was released from prison in Turku in May 1988, he and his then-girlfriend began to roam around Finland and Sweden. On July 3, 1988, Juha steals a motorcycle, hoping to go unnoticed in the dark. However, the owner of the motorcycle, Stan Nilsson, and his 15-year-old son caught Juha red-handed. A chase ensued, which ended tragically in the cemetery. 
Juha shot both of them with a shotgun. That same night, he also caught Nielsen's wife, Eva, whose throat he slit not far from the cemetery. A week later, Juha and his girlfriend were caught in Denmark. At the trial, the two defendants accused each other of the murders. A forensic psychiatrist found that Juha had psychopathic personality traits and was very aggressive because of his disorder. In the end, this murder case became his 12th criminal conviction. And this time, everything seemed to make sense. Juha was sentenced to life in prison on three counts of murder and transferred to Finland to serve his time, while his girlfriend received two years for accessory to assault and battery. Juha tried to escape from prison five times – in 1991, 1994, 2002, 2006, 2022. And he wouldn't believe it. Even those escapes, although guards with police, caught the convict fairly quickly, sometimes just a few meters from the prison walls. Now, even those escapes didn't make a strong argument. After serving 19 years in prison, Juha was released on February 25, 2008. For the next few years, Juha, who had already changed his name a couple of times by that time, violated his parole and returned to prison. Then he was released again. In the end, it all ended on February 27, 2023, when Nikita Bergenstrom died at the age of 57. And perhaps the last case for today is the story of how systemic mistakes are and how many people can suffer because a villain was given an insufficiently harsh sentence, or worse, released early. By rough estimates, Raoul Meza Jr. may have killed a total of about 12 people. The first time he broke the law was on December 31, 1975, when he and three accomplices robbed a store in Austin and shot the store manager in the back. Fortunately, the manager survived the attack and testified against Meza. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison for the crime, but Meza only served five years. On January 3, 1982, just a year after his release, Meza Jr. suddenly grabbed eight-year-old Kendra Page as she was riding her bicycle on the playground. Meza raped the girl before strangling her and dumping her body in a dumpster outside the school, where police found it. The crime thrilled the city's community and frightened parents and Meza confessed to the murder a few days later. He then took a plea bargain and received a 30-year sentence. However, as with previous sentence, he was released from prison after 11 years due to good behavior. In 1994, he violated his parole and went back to prison, returning to the streets of Austin as early as 2002. Either Meza tolerated all this time or he covered his tracks well, but the next time he was talked about again was when he called the police in May 24, 2023 and confessed to the murders of Gloria Lofton and Jess Frager. Gloria's body was found in 2019 at her home. She was 66 years old, and for some reason, police assumed she died of natural causes. In the second case, even though Jess Frager was 8 years old, police had to investigate the case because the body was found in the suburbs. He had a belt wrapped around his neck. There were blood spatters and knives scattered around. Police eventually apprehended Meza at a hotel in North Austin on May 29th and took him into custody. So far, no verdict has been handed down. The community can only hope that at least this time, the killer will not go free. And that will be all. We hope we surprised you today. See you in more videos.